You consume it daily. You go through more than you probably realize. You are literally made of it. But how much do you really know about water? Join me, Lake Story Water, and my droid, H2O, as we travel in search of the science behind water and water-related concepts. This is Story of Water. One of the most important natural resources in North America, if not the most important, consists of five lakes with a combined area of about 95,000 square miles, bordering eight states. They contain six quadrillion gallons of water, which to put into perspective would be enough water to cover the entire 48 connected United States nine feet deep. This is 90% of the U.S. freshwater supply and 20% of the entire world supply. I'm talking about the Great Lakes, of course. How did these Great Lakes become so great? What makes them so great now? In this multi-episode series, we'll explore the past, present, and future of the Great Lakes. This is part one, the history of the Great Lakes. How did the Great Lakes form? Well, we need to go back 14,000 years to when a massive glacier or sheet of ice covered the Great Lakes area. This glacier was over 3,000 feet or one kilometer thick. Can you provide a comparison for how tall that is? Well, take the world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, then stack the Statue of Liberty on top of that, and then you would be at the same height of the glacier. That glacier began to melt as the climate began to warm and the bulk of it receded north toward present-day Canada. As the glacier moved at a blistering rate of several centimeters per day, it began carving out major portions of land. As the glacier melted, these depressions that were left behind filled with meltwater from the glacier. This led to the formation of Lake Chicago, which was the beginning of the southern end of Lake Michigan, and Lake Maumee, which was the beginning of the western end of Lake Erie. Lake Erie was the first lake to take its current form about 10,000 years ago. At around the same time, Lake Algonquin formed from a combination of Lake Michigan and Lake Huron spilling over and engulfing what is present-day Michigan. During the same period, Lake Duluth formed as the beginning of the western end of Lake Superior. Lake Ontario was the second lake to take shape about 7,000 years ago. Lake levels around this time were decreasing, however, due to water draining through more basin areas left by the glacier. However, as the glacier retreated farther, the land actually began to rise because it didn't have the weight of the glacier pushing it down. The water levels began to rise again, and it led to the formation of Lake Nipissing, which was a combination of Lakes Huron, Michigan, and Superior. Once the current route of drainage for these three lakes was established into Lake Erie, Lakes Huron, Michigan, and Superior took their current form between 6,000 and 3,000 years ago. I did not realize the Great Lakes were so young. The Great Lakes are now one system of lakes where water flows in a predictable pattern. If a drop of rain were to fall in Lake Superior, it would travel to all the lakes and eventually end up in the Atlantic Ocean. How is that possible? Well, let's go on a journey through each lake. Starting in the northernmost lake, Lake Superior, you would be in the largest Great Lake by area and volume. Lake Superior is 31,700 square miles in area and contains 2,900 cubic miles of water. It is also the deepest, with an average depth of 483 feet and a maximum depth of 1,333 feet. Lake Superior actually contains more water than the other four Great Lakes combined. There's enough water in Lake Superior to cover North and South America with a foot of water. It is the highest in elevation at 600 feet above sea level and the coldest with an average water temperature of about 44 degrees Fahrenheit. Because of all the water in Lake Superior, it would take a drop of water 191 years on average to cycle through the lake from west to east and move on to the next lake. 
This is what's known as retention time. After leaving Superior, water flows into either Lake Huron or Lake Michigan. Huron and Michigan are hydrologically considered one lake as they have the same elevation of 577 feet and are not separated by a river but by the Straits of Mackinac. Lake Michigan is 22,300 square miles in area and contains 1,180 cubic miles of water. It has an average depth of 279 feet with a maximum depth of 923 feet. It has an average temperature of about 50 degrees. A water drop starting in northern Lake Michigan would travel clockwise going south along the eastern side and turning north along the western side until reaching the Straits of Mackinac again and flowing into Lake Huron 99 years later. That Lake Michigan is the only great lake that lies entirely in the United States. Lake Huron is 23,000 square miles in area and contains 850 cubic miles of water. It has an average depth of 195 feet with a maximum depth of 750 feet. It has an average temperature of about 48 degrees. A water drop would take 22 years to move from the north end to the south end of the lake before flowing into Lake Erie. Lake Erie is the southernmost lake and is 9,910 square miles in area and contains 116 cubic miles of water. It has an elevation of 569 feet. It is the shallowest lake with an average depth of 62 feet and a maximum depth of 210 feet. It has an average temperature of about 52 degrees. Since it is so shallow, a water drop would only take 2.6 years to move from the west end to the east end of the lake before flowing into Lake Ontario. However, before the drop of water can move on to Lake Ontario, it must descend about 187 feet over Niagara Falls. This results in Lake Ontario having an elevation of only 243 feet. Lake Ontario is the easternmost lake and is 7,340 square miles in area and contains 393 cubic miles of water. It has an average depth of 283 feet with a maximum depth of 802 feet. It has an average temperature of about 56 degrees. It takes a water drop six years to move from the west end to the east end of the lake before flowing into the St. Lawrence River. With the swift moving St. Lawrence River, it would take the drop of water about eight more days to get to the ocean. According to my calculations, a drop of water will travel from Lake Superior to the ocean after 320 years. Just think, the water that is reaching the ocean as we speak started in Lake Superior in the year 1700, before the United States even existed. The first inhabitants of the Great Lakes area arrived about 10,000 years ago, as the lakes were beginning their formation. These native people hunted, fished, gathered, farmed, and used the forest for many of their necessities. Maple trees provided sugar, and birch trees were used for housing materials and canoes. The fertile soil allowed for crops such as corn, beans, peas, squash, and pumpkins to be grown. Diets were supplemented with wild apples, berries, and wild game, and in some areas, wild rice. Over 120 different bands of Native Americans have called the Great Lakes home since then. By the 1500s, it is estimated that about 90,000 indigenous people lived in the Great Lakes region. Prior to the arrival of Europeans, there were many tribes around the Great Lakes. Here are nine of the bigger tribes. The Iroquois, or people of the Longhouse, lived from the Niagara River along the south side of Lake Ontario to the Hudson River in what is currently New York. The Huron, who called themselves the Wyandotte, meaning island or peninsula dwellers, lived from the north side of Lake Ontario to Lake Huron and to the north side of Lake Erie in present-day Ontario and southern lower Michigan. The Ottawa, or traders, lived along the shores of Lake Huron and north toward Lake Superior in present-day Ontario and northern lower Michigan. 
the Erie, or people of the Panther, lived along the south side of Lake Erie in what is currently Ohio. There were five prominent tribes of the Algonquian nation, which were the Ojibwe, the Menominee, the Potawatomi, the Fox, and the Sauk. The Ojibwe had the largest range and lived along the shores of Lake Superior to the northwestern side of Lake Michigan in present-day Ontario and Upper Michigan. The Menominee lived along the northwestern side of Lake Michigan in present-day northern Wisconsin. The Potawatomi lived along all the shores of Lake Michigan except the northwest in present-day Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan. The Fox lived along the western side of Lake Michigan in what is currently eastern Wisconsin. The Sauk lived along the southern side of Lake Huron to the southern side of Lake Michigan in what is currently southern lower Michigan, Illinois, and Wisconsin. For more information about the Native Americans that lived around the Great Lakes, go to our website story-of-water.com and check out the blog where I list some great books to read as further resources. The French were the first non-Native Americans to set eyes on the Great Lakes. Explorers, fur traders, and missionaries all ventured inward on the continent searching for fame, fortune, and faith. Explorer Samuel de Champlain was believed to be the first European to see Niagara Falls, perhaps as early as 1604. In 1615, Champlain met with his interpreter and fellow explorer Etienne Brulé in New France, which is present-day Quebec. Brulé reported that he had ventured westward along the Ottawa River and through some other water routes came to a great inland sea. This would have been Georgian Bay, which is on the eastern side of Lake Huron. He then followed the north shore of Lake Huron, paddled up the St. Mary's River, and made it to another great inland sea. This would have been Lake Superior. Brulé told of other journeys, and historians speculate that he may have also been the first European to see Lakes Erie and Ontario. Later that same year, Champlain proceeded to take the same route to Lake Huron as well, but when he got to Georgian Bay, he went south and ended up getting out of the water and going through present-day Ontario until he got to Lake Ontario. It was from here that he led a military expedition with his Huron allies against their enemies, the Iroquois. The party crossed Lake Ontario into present-day New York, but were forced to retreat back across the lake. In 1634, explorer Jean Nicolet left from Georgian Bay in a birch bark canoe and headed westward in Lake Huron and through the Straits of Mackinac, coming into Lake Michigan and becoming the first European to see this lake. He continued his journey westward, reaching Green Bay on the western side of the lake. In 1669, explorer Louis Joliet was returning from an expedition to Lake Superior when he came across an Iroquois prisoner. He was allowed to take the prisoner back to Canada, and the prisoner actually guided him to and through Lake Erie eastward to the Grand River. This route allowed him to get back to Lake Ontario from overland. With the exception of Lake Superior, the Great Lakes were named after Native American words and tribes. Lake Superior was first known as Lac Superior in French, meaning Upper Lake. To the Ojibwa, however, it was known as Kichigami or Gichigami, meaning Great Sea. You may have heard this name used in Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem, The Song of Hiawatha. By the shore of Gichigumi, by the shining big sea water. Or perhaps in Gordon Lightfoot's song, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. The legend lives on from the Chippewa on down of the big lake they call Gichigumi. Lake Ontario was first named Lake St. Louis. It was later named Ontario, which means beautiful lake in Iroquois. Lake Erie was named after the tribe that lived along its shore. It was originally called Lac du Chat in French, meaning Lake of the Cat, as the Erie's name for themselves was the people of the panther. Lake Huron was first known as La Mer Douce in French, meaning the freshwater sea. It was later named Huron after the tribe that lived along its shore. Lake Michigan went through several names before its current form. 
It was first known as Grand Lac. Then it was called Lake of the Stinking Waters or Lake of the Puants after a small tribe that lived along its shores. Then it was known as Lake St. Joseph. Finally, it was named after the Ojibwa term Michigami, meaning great water. Well, that brings us to the end of this first episode on the Great Lakes. Join us next time as we look at the current state of the Great Lakes. Goodbye. Thanks for joining us on Story of Water. If you liked what you heard, why not subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast provider? Let your friends and family know about it as well. Connect with us and listen directly at www.story-of-water.com. Check out the blog or email us feedback. If you really enjoyed the show, become a Patreon supporter. Just click the donate button on our website. Remember, stay hydrated. See you next time on Story of Water.